I'll read through a checklist to ensure that, uh, that the meeting that we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As a member of the Commission to Study Environmentally Triggered Chronic Illness Education Subcommittee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that one, we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. Second, we have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting to the Senate in the Senate calendar. Three, we are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email one word, remote Senate at ledge dot state dot nh dot us or simply call 603-271-3043. Four, in the event the public is unable to access, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Five, please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where they are and if anyone else is in the room with you during the meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Uh, Jeffrey Salloway will call the roll here based on those who signed up. And that includes uh, Margaret DiTulio, just say present if you're here. Is Margaret here, Margaret Tatulio. Brian Mooney, is Brian Mooney aboard? Jeff Salloway, I am here in my home office in Lee, New Hampshire. Uh, Representative Gary Woods. Uh, here, um, I'm at uh, home in my study uh, and I'm alone. Uh, the Honorable Mindy Mesmer. Mindy, I know you're there. I, yes, I am in my home in Rye in my office by myself. And last but certainly not least, Representative Nancy Murphy. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am home in Merrimack in a room by myself, but in a house full of people. Huh. Excellent. Uh, we are now officially meeting, which is excellent. And um, I think it's probably wise of us to first discuss the chairmanship of this subcommittee. Is there anyone who would like to volunteer for that chairmanship? I'd like to nominate uh, Representative Soloway. That's Second. All those in favor, I think we'll go out with a voice vote, seeing there's only five of us. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Are there any nays? Okay, we now need someone to take notes of the meeting. Um, is there anyone who is willing to be secretary to take limited notes? And keep in mind that you can watch this uh, video on YouTube afterwards so that you can supplement your notes with whatever you did uh, take. 
Is, oh, is that Aaron? Alan. Alan. Oh, thank you, Alan. No problem, guys. Um, anybody willing to simply take notes and then watch YouTube if they miss anything? I just, I can't, I, I know that I can't take notes and be active participant at the same time. <laughs> Gary, so Nancy, are you willing to do that? Uh, I'm I'm a terrible note taker. <laughs> um, Nancy, I'll, I'll, Nancy, would you be willing to do it, please? I I I will. I I'm probably as bad as Gary, if not worse. I'll have to handwrite them because I don't. Technology is not my thing. Okay. So thank you, Nancy. I will do my best. Okay. Um, as a first item of business, uh, I'd like to know if you all received. A, a draft statement, which I circulated to you uh, about a day and a half ago. Did anybody get that? Okay. Um, I got it. All right. And do we have any response to that? Is that up for discussion? I think in, in personally, I think in general, it, it uh, is uh, satisfactory for what we're uh, approaching, but it uh, would require some you know, minor um, editorial <laughs> changes, I think. And? Well, uh, first of all, I think uh, I'll just uh, start through. Uh, in the first sentence, it says, in the past session, uh, it might be wise <laughs> to... Yes. Uh, might be wise to state the session because as we go forward, it won't, uh, people reading it won't know exactly what session that is. So we need to identify it with yes, the, okay. uh, the uh, 2019 session. Um, following that, uh, you have HR 1538. It probably should be HB. Yes. Um, um, then as far as the, um, it's the House Committee on Health. Uh, the title should be correct. Uh, it should be the Committee on Health, on Health, Human Services, and Elderly Affairs. Health, Human, yeah, Committee on Health, Human Services. Health, okay. Human Services. Okay, I'm making these changes, Representative, as you are saying them. I, I just, that's the title of our committee. I've got that. Uh, I need to go back one. You suggested in the past session that would be of the legislature. 2019. Got it. I have all of those changes thus far. Okay. And then in the next paragraph, uh, second paragraph, uh, the uh, title of the committee uh, should be uh, changed to reflect the, the same corrected title. Got it. Health, um, human services, and elderly affairs. Got it? Yep. Um, uh, those are uh, uh, the the extent of the uh, editorial comments. Okay. I'll just I'll let other people comment about content um, or other things before we go forward looking at the rest of it. Okay. Uh, further comments? Could I just ask Representative Salvi, could you screen share that? Um, <laughs> probably not. Just a second. <laughs> Don't worry, I couldn't either. <laughs> okay, just... how does one screen share? There should be a bottom at the at the bottom of your screen, the Zoom window. There should be a green lit up button with an arrow in it that says screen share or share screen. I'm going to find that. And then when you click that, it should come up with a bunch of the Got windows. It. And then you click the window that you want and you click share. Okay. And my goodness, look at that. Okay. I have clicked the window, clicked share, and let's see what happens. There you go. That is not, oh, wait a minute. Where am I? Here we, oh, that's, 
That's not the document that I expected. All right. Um, let me try once again. You can click the same button and it should give you the option to pick another window. Unfortunately, my consultant is upstairs on her own um, on her own conference. Um, I can't even find where you guys are right now on my screen. Okay. If you go to at the top of your screen, it should have uh, view options and it might be able, you might have another thing that says share new window. I've, I've just hit stop share. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Now, this says subcommittee. That's where it should be. I'm going to hit this once more and hope that it comes up, but I'm not sure it will. And if not, I'm gonna find another way to do it. So that should be coming up now. Nope. Oh, maybe, hang on. The document, you're just at the bottom of the page. Okay. Ah. Scroll right. up the page. There's, got, there's going to be another way to do this. So sit tight for just a minute. And I'm going to do this another way. As you can tell, I am not practiced at this. Okay. Um, there's my Aaron Jones, right? Okay. And Aaron Jones is there. If I move this over here, and I ask it, I'm going to ask it. Okay, I've asked it to paste the document into an email. And I'm hoping that the email goes to all of you. But I'm not sure it will. That's not going to happen. And now I have lost you all. No, uh, um, Jeff. Yep. You can't just scroll scroll up the page. Um, Go over I, and just just pretend like you're scrolling up the page. Okay, I'm I'm better now. Okay, and and then use the roller. Yeah. Now use the roller part of your get no get the arrow down in the body of your page. Now use the roller to, to. All right, guys, this is, this is a waste of our time. So Gary, you've read the document, right? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, oh, there you are. Ah, and so I had to hit share screen. I just, I stopped the sharing because I thought you wanted me to. Break. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Um, now, what if we don't have a chat button? And what if I hit the whiteboard? And... This is a pain, guys.
Nope, that's not going to work either. Jeff. Yeah. Do you want to send it to me and I'll share it? Or do you want me yeah, to just pull up what you had? That would be fine. So did you already make did you already make changes to it though? I'm gonna I already made the changes to it, but hang on. I'm gonna send that to you. Oh, here we are. So I'm gonna send a new message. I'm gonna send it to Mindy. I'm gonna copy it. This is going to your Gmail address. And that's going to be there right now. And that should be there. Got it. Did that show up? Yes. Okay. It's, on, it's downloading. Hmm. What a pain. Working. Thank you. Here it is. Okay. All right. I can make the changes if you want. Okay. The changes should already be made. Okay. In case it isn't obvious to all of you, I have never run a meeting on Zoom, nor do I intend to make it a habit. <laughs> you're, oh. you're the chair now. <laughs> you got to get used to it. <laughs> this is going to end, folks. <laughs> I'll scroll down a little bit now. Um, I have a question. This came up in our prior data collection meeting. Um, and we started talking about EMRs. Um, should we, should we somehow uh, put that in as one of the recommendations, either maybe the challenge uh, recommending the top environmental risk factors, or no, that would be the next something about where they can integrate their findings so that clinical findings so that they can be readily 
uh, used for, for our purposes or for the purposes of DHHS. Am I making sense? Uh, okay, if you don't find it all, that, sen that sentiment already in there, I think part of it depends on how granular we want to be. Um, I, I think from my perspective as um, I mean, no longer a pr practicing clinician, um, I mean, I think that include uh, in there um, uh, would be included in what, what is said there so far. And it's a very general term for sure. Uh, but again, as I said, it depends on how granular we want to be. Um, uh, as, as people know that the, the different EMR platforms uh, to get something on an EMR platform um, would depend upon the particular individual. Like uh, if you work for Elliott Hospital uh, uh, and you're uh, a clinician in their uh, uh, program, uh, they may have a particular platform. Um, someone at Concord Hospital may have a different platform. Uh, and as a consequence to get it integrated across uh, uh, all all platforms would be um, a bit of a do. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, am I? Is that clear to understand? Oh yeah, I'm, you're making great sense. Um, um, so, so I, because of because of uh, there there are so many platforms, and that's one of the, the difficulties currently is the fact that none of the platforms speak to one another. So if you go to one hospital and you want to transfer notes, it, it you either have to download it and uh, 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 send it as a PDF, but it doesn't integrate directly into uh, the other other platforms format. And as a consequence, um, uh, we're still uh, in a haphazard fashion. Um, so I, I wasn't sure how granular we wanted to be, but that would be a topic uh, as, as is pointed out uh, for the associations, uh, meaning yeah. hospitals uh, and specialty societies to address that. Uh, and that is something that I know the medical society and specialty societies pull their hair out on a regular basis. You know, how can we do that? And the AMA has looked at uh, in the past, not currently, uh, because it's just too big a, a business item, uh, but um, uh, ha in the past has looked to try to try to improve uh, the uh, interchangeability, interoperability of uh, the d different platforms. Um, and uh, business has prevailed and has uh, 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 preserved their own uh, platforms and their proprietary measures. Uh, okay. it's, it's, it's an ongoing problem. Representative Woods, you are so accurate and we are facing an electronic medical records problem that is created by software engineers and entrepreneurs Correct. Rather than clinicians, mm -hmm. as yep. a result of which, um, there's a lot of money that changes hands, and the clinicians find that they are bound by decisions of the software engineers and the entrepreneurs. So, what I did with this whole concept was I spoke to um, public health officers. So you find them represented in this document. Spoke to clinicians, you find them represented in this document. Spoke to people who are active in the professional associations and said, okay, how do we balance this? What you have in essence is, uh, okay, let me back up. Let, let me start over again, okay? Let me go to a different place entirely. I apologize. A number of years ago, I was invited to a conference at the National uh, Institute of Medicine in DC. It was a terrific conference. They brought together uh, public health professionals, clinicians, and environmentalists. And they said, here we have three different paradigms for the causes and treatment of disease. It is absolutely essential that we integrate these perspectives to come up with a holistic understanding of where diseases come from, 
and how we can intervene to prevent and to treat these diseases. As I say, it was an excellent conference. And like many of these conferences, it reached no conclusions whatsoever. <laughs> it, was, it was very successful. So we face exactly that problem in that we're trying to take data based on environmental risk and make it relevant to clinicians without intruding on the clinician patient relationship, which is sacred. Vice versa. Yeah, it, it's, it's sacred. So one of the people that I spoke to, one of the environmentalists made it very clear that for the state of New Hampshire, the environmental risks are first of all, very geographical. Um, arsenic, PFAS, mercury, uh, MTBE, these, these are very specifically geographical. And they said, but you have local public health officers and they are the ones who can be most attentive to these local risks. And you have the hospitals in the professional associations who are very active in keeping their professionals up to date, running in service education for them. And they are the people best equipped to do the education. Ultimately, however, it is the decision of the individual practitioner for how to use that information. And that's a paradigm that I'm very comfortable with. Um, I, I can't say to Representative Woods, in your practice as a hand surgeon, I'd like you to be attentive to um, your patient's exposure to arsenic. It's not relevant. Right. And it's his clinical decision. And I can't intrude. So that's why this was drawn up in this particular fashion. Can I ask you a question? So By is all means. there a reporting requirement for a cancer identification for a cancer yeah. clinical evaluation? So and how does that happen then? There, there's a, there's a clinic, there's a, um, well, there's several levels. Um, um, I, I don't know how granular it is because I'm, I, I don't go to those sessions, but uh, there is a review session once a month uh, and generally the general surgeons, the oncologists and the internists uh, attend and they go over uh, basically uh, the, the cancer data for that hospital. All cancers are recorded and I don't know how many of them are, re they're recorded, but I don't know how many are reported uh, to the state or, or any other agency. Uh, I just don't uh, deal with cancer enough to answer that, but I do know uh, that they are recorded uh, and there is a review um, on a monthly basis, a case review. Uh, and as I said, generally the general surgeons, the oncologists and the internists uh, uh, review those. And that's an, uh, uh, by each hospital. Uh, so I know that's in place uh, if, for cancer. Uh, other entities, uh, n not so much. Uh, in some areas, they're, they're not even recorded. Um, uh, and some are, are very rare and they just don't get recorded. Uh, there's a rare rheumatologic disorder uh, that um, is a, a latent uh, a problem, uh, uh, occurs in females, obviously, if, because it only occurs uh, during pregnancy. It turns out uh, after the pregnancy, the, the, uh, rheum uh, the rheumatologic condition uh, flares, never having been there before. Uh, and turns out, uh, uh, once uh, the individual gets pregnant again, the arthritis goes away. So if that individual stays pregnant, um, there's uh, uh, she's uh, symptom free. Um, but that's a very rare. So those kinds of things don't uh, percolate to the surface. Are you, are you uh, saying that some cancers are not required to be reported? To no, I, no, I, no, I'm not making the equivalent. Okay. I'm just saying that the cancers no, no, are, the cancers thought... are recorded but other uh, sort of um, um, less prevalent uh, and less understood uh, disorders never sure. get reported. Yeah, so, but how mechanically does the report get made to the cancer registry? 
Uh, that, as I said, I, I don't participate in that process, so I, I, I'm, I, I can't comment on, on whether it's all cancers get uh, reported to someone or someplace uh, or only just uh, particular ones. Um, I, I, I can't answer that. I, I, so I guess my point is, you know, how that technically happens then there is a, there seems to be a process by which that is supposed to happen. So I don't know that we should then, I would agree that we shouldn't specify EMRs, but in some way uh, we would want some sort of reporting central agency to receive a report of what's known to be an environmentally triggered disease. So whether it be by EMR or some sort of reporting mechanism that is made up by DHHS, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter to me, but that they just mentioned EMRs um, the other uh, today, but sorry, no. Jeff, I cut you off. No, that, that's, um, I, I have to reach back to recall, as I remember, Dartmouth got funded to yes. create a statewide cancer registry. Yes. They went to hospital to hospital to hospital to try to get cancer cases entered into their registry. I don't know how comprehensive that effort has been, how successful it has or has not been, or how long it takes a hospital to enter that data. I just don't know. It's an interesting question. But even uh, going a little bit further, uh, it's one thing uh, to have the registry, but it requires the clinician that's dealing with the entity to A, uh, be aware that, that in fact, uh, excuse me, I'm going to have to take this call. Uh, my apologies, one second. Go ahead. So I guess I just what I'm saying is, you know, we would love to have some sort of centralized reporting database mechanism, mechanism to some central operating authority that will collect the information, however best clinicians need to report it in so that that data can be used for the purposes we talk about here. Um, if I were asked, and I haven't been, if I were asked, whether this was in the purview of this subcommittee, I would tend to say, well, no, the charge to the committee is simply to address the issue of education. Having said that, however, I think the idea of adding a reporting recommendation is a very good one. And I'd be willing to take a crack at authoring that. Well, that's kind of part of the education too, right? Because if all of a sudden physicians are asked to uh, report on ulcerative colitis, well, why am I doing that? Um, you're doing that because it's known to be associated with exposure to PFAS and we suspect that they're, you know, so it's kind of like a circular thing. Once people know that conditions, certain conditions are identified as being related to exposures to arsenic or whatever, uh, because they're reporting it. Uh, that's in, in a way educating the. the, the well, it, um, it's extraordinarily valuable data if you have someone competent to look at that data and analyze it. It's extremely useful. Uh, and the potential to unearth environmental causes of disease it is terribly powerful. And, you know, I, I, I agree that you know, we can uh, attach that to this document and recommend it strongly. Um, I, I, I uh, certainly data um, is, is, should drive everything we do. I mean, uh, evidence-based uh, work. Uh, I would just be uh, at the same time cautious that there's probably not much that we don't see in the office that wouldn't provide a data set or, or, or contribute to a data set someplace that would be a benefit. And I think we have to make sure that when we recommend it, 
that this has a, a good sort of, shall we say, cost benefit uh, to it. Um, uh, I mean, there's, uh, and, and of course you never know where you're gonna find the good data. Uh, and the classic one was a gal from Stanford who uh, looked at 5,000 breast cancers uh, and had the, the, the actual microscopic slides, treatment and five-year outcomes and she was trying to sort of uh, look at uh, breast cancer from the pathology's perspective, uh, like the pap smears uh, that could be computerized. Well, she asked the reverse question, what should we be looking at? And it turns out the computer came up uh, using AI techniques that it wasn't the, uh, there, you look at the cell, yes, but it wasn't the cancer cells themselves or the cells in the breast that were uh, uh, telling you everything, but it was in between the cells, or what's called the stroma. There were 11 factors in the stroma that were predictive factors. So you never know where good data will lead you. Uh -huh. so I hate to throw away good data, but if you look at the workload to get that, it becomes almost unmanageable. Um, that coupled with the fact that we're now doing a lot more with telemedicine uh, and that will alter how uh, databases are populated. That'd be easier then. Pardon me? I bet you it's going to make it a lot easier. In some, in, in some instances, yes. In some instances. I just, I'm, I'm not trying to be a downer on collecting or making uh, a registry. I just, that I have to be be the spokesman for uh, having someone in the office uh, and been on the short end of edicts from specialty societies that you have to provide this data to the specialty society if you're a member. Uh, it can be extremely onerous. Um, the, the other thing that you need representative is you have to have somebody, and you've mentioned this, to analyze the data, to do the task. One of our favorite topics over the breakfast table between my significant other and I is, well, right now, even as we sit here, somebody's writing a doctoral dissertation on this topic. <laughs> um, in the state of New Hampshire, um, I'm not confident that we have the resource capacity to analyze the data or in some cases, do we have the will to analyze the data? Um, I don't think that our state bureaucracy um, has the resources to do it. And I'm not sure they could if they did have the resources. That's pretty specialized work. Yes. And we've already seen one example of that years ago uh, when uh, self-referrals was a big issue especially physicians uh, who, whose office had uh, sort of an in-house physical therapy. Uh, so you could not self-refer unless you uh, identified to the patient uh, two other facilities for which you could also be referred right. for the same services. And that had to be reported to the state uh, by law. Well, it turns out we did that for two years, but it turns out the state had no resource to look at it record it, analyze it. And as a consequence, all that reporting went into the circular file. It's, it's a good subject for somebody who's a grant writer. Um, so now you raise the question, do we append a paragraph recommending the creation of a registry of some kind of environmentally uh, caused diagnoses. I, um, I would be in favor of doing that if we could put it in the form of, if, we, if in the course of time, we find a particular mode of exposure that is, would be a would warrant and would be an appropriate registry to form. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I uh, wouldn't want to make it a blanket statement. So you would open this up as an opportunity 
yep. without mandating its actual creation. Correct. I, we, to me, to, to express that going forward, that there is data there that would express the position that there is the potential for, for some very good data we're not collecting. And if we discover that there are some, just like the, uh, the cancer cluster in the seacoast, uh, that became very clear that collecting that data would be extraordinarily valuable. Um, and uh, the same thing with uh, Litchfield Merrimack with uh, collecting data uh, with the PFAS. Um, all that data is extraordinarily valuable. And if something were be to, uh, to be identified as we did a few years ago, or maybe 15 years with the mercury, uh, that was also very valuable. What have we done? What have we done? <laughs> ah, well, um, <laughs> um, if the committee so chooses, I can take a crack at a paragraph, append that to the document that you have seen before you, and send you the entire document, and I can get that done in a day or two. Um, I'm, I would be uh, amenable, especially if you're doing it. <laughs> well, um, I, I had to put a lot of thought and a fair amount of research into putting this together. Oh, yeah, I, I, thank you. Um, it, it goes back to that conference at the National Institute of Medicine. Um, yeah, I walked out of there uh, really enlightened as to what I heard, but without any sense that we could bring together an epidemiologic model a clinical model and an environmental model and make it all work. And I think here, uh, there's a start, there's a start here. Uh, so I'll take a crack at that and I'll have that to you within a couple of days. Okay, Is, do we have any uh, citizens on the line who would like to comment? Do we have anybody there? Oh, there's Margaret Tertullio. We oh. do not uh, have anybody on the attendees in the public. Okay. Well, um, is there further business before the subcommittee at this time? Yes. Nancy? Representative yep. Murphy? No, thank you. I, I'm, I'm just confused. So are we suggesting that it is or is not a good idea to create a registry? Uh, we are suggesting that there is the opportunity to create a registry um, and that this is an option that ought to be explored. All right. I, I'm just thinking in terms of, uh, we just had a data um, subcommittee meeting just before yeah. this call. And I know that was one of the things we we're talking about that, like just in terms of like PFAS, for example, we have the C8 study with known health outcomes, um, you know, real, that uh, health uh, impacts that are known to be associated with PFAS exposure. Um, and in a community like ours, the whole reason that I wrote this bill to begin with was because, um, you know, this certainly has been an issue since in here since 2016. Mm. So we're going on five years, five years that we've known about it, but probably 20 years or more that we've been exposed to it. Um, and the seacoast as well. We certainly have areas of the state that are um, disproportionately impacted. You know, I certainly would agree with, you know, the, I, I think it was Gary that had said a while ago, you know, there's certain areas of um, and issues that impact us in different ways. Um, but you know, we, we know that our health providers, uh, many remain um, uninformed or, um, you know, and, and we, I think we realized when Gary and I were doing some of the work trying to figure out how to, how to do that, that, you know, we realized it was going to be a big issue that, you know, even if we have to just start out in the, the areas that are the most impacted, you know, that, that, that would, that would work. Um, I think until we start having um, and we just, again, had that conversation on the last phone call was nobody's collecting the data. There is where we're, we have communities that are suggesting by just anecdotal information. And, and um, what we're hearing is that the impacts that we're seeing in the C8 study are just being seen here too, but there's no central place um, for, right. um, for that data collection. And so that's why I, I was certainly hoping that we would start in whatever format um, um, 
that that start to be looked at. And I know that's what we, we just discovered discussed in the data um, subcommittee as well, that um, that's sort of the missing piece. We looked for, uh, I think part of the, the charge of the commission was to look at gaps. And this was is one of them is that, um, you know, there are, you know, at least in this one particular, the PFAS area alone, that that's a gap, not only the provider education, but the actual data, um, mm -hmm. because nobody's collecting it. So, you know, I would certainly be supportive of, of you know, a registry, you know, based on like the C8 impact, uh, um, uh, the CPA, CA panel to look at those, especially in areas of the state that are most impacted. And, you know, I mean, certainly everywhere, but, um, you know, we've got, you know, I think like just think of our town alone and the towns that are impacted by just one polluter, we're looking at 28,000 people in this community alone, never mind the other. So there's a lot of people that are um, having, um, you know, health impacts known to be associated with this contamination that are going to providers that are that are not informed. Um, I think it's probably getting better because we're all citizens are informing. Um, and I think providers are probably hearing about it maybe more, you know, maybe more recently, but it's a, it's certainly a, um, you know, a need. And I, I know um, the first time actually I met Tom Sherman was at a meeting at the, the medical society with um, uh uh, Andrea Miko from Testing for Peas, um, Merrimack Citizens for Clean Water was there. And, you know, they were saying the same thing. They found the same thing on the seacoast, that we had citizens that are more informed than, than, than the health providers that are driving their care yeah, and yeah. overseeing their care. So I think we've got to get it on the radar. But, you know, providers need to, to be better informed, especially in those areas where the patients that they're seeing are, you know, and um, and I, I use the example of, of um you know, and I think that was part of the, the 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 frustration for communities is that they're going to their providers with you know the health impacts that that we know are, are, are of concern, um, and and you know maybe nobody's putting it together now. What that would mean in terms of what how that would change healthcare and, and everything else is 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 a separate subject, but um, you know I think it's important that that providers be aware that patients. Um, you know, have, you know, have, have the ability to go to inform providers um, and that the state collect the information we need them to. I, I, in the, in the um, you know, I, I, I know so much is funding and resources, but I think this is the place in these commissions where we need to say, this is what we need. You know, we recognize that everything's not going to happen right away and that we need funding, but that's sort of the, this could sort of be the driving you know, the motivation to say, hey, we need more resources in DHHS. We need to, you know, get in legislation so we have, you know, somebody to in place to do those things or, or DES or whatever the case may be. So I just was, I was just confused whether we were recommending that or not recommending that, or, I mean, I know it's always, always an opportunity, but, but is it something that, that, you know, people felt was important? And, and I, I just wanted to say that I did. So. Well, we, it appears that we have three sentiments that have been expressed. One of them is, well, is the creation of a registry within the purview of this subcommittee. So put that aside. The second is, well, uh, in my clinical practice, I have seen where physicians were encouraged to generate data and the data got collected and then it went into this what uh, Representative Woods refers to as the circular file. Um, the third sentiment um, is uh, Representative Murphy's uh, strong argument. Um, look, if you have the data, we have an obligation to put it together and to analyze it. And then we have to find the resources to do that. And I'm not sure how we would find those resources especially in what we are facing in, in the current budget year. Uh, and I, I don't know that DHHS has those resources or what. And then I am told that it is now my responsibility to craft a paragraph that pulls all this together and sounds sensible. I think Margaret had a comment. Yes. Um 
<clears throat> I apologize for being late in primary care. As most of you know, it's somewhat unpredictable. So best laid plans. You're uh, worth waiting for. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm trying to, I have a little hoarse voice. So um, as the person in the trenches here in primary care, I see things from a different level. So I don't have the global view of the data and all of that that you folks do. I have the view from a day-to-day -day clinician who now as a result of this, of my participation on this committee, ask every one of my patients at their well visits, do you have a well? And has your well water been tested in the last few years? And it's amazing what can be done just with that simple intervention. So I'm, I see things on a very lowest common denominator, the nuts and bolts of how can we use the data we already have? And we have a lot of data, public health, health and human services, DES. We, we have a lot of data. We could, we could pick things out of that that could then be communicated as we do in New Hampshire on a shoestring because we have all of these professional organizations. We have the Medical Society, we have the Nurse Practitioner Association, we have the Physician Assistant Association, the Naturopathic Doctors, the New Hampshire Nurses Association. We have all of these organizations that represent people, that interact with people um, in the community and that um, for us to be able to do something through those organizations, to contact, you know, I'd be very glad at some point if the committee felt it important to get the, the people that were leading those organizations so that we could then see about their conferences and once the committee had decided what to what they wanted to do. But something as simple as at a at a professional conference, having a lecturer talk about in New Hampshire how important it is for people to um, encourage their patients who have wells to test the water. Or I can tell you, since the radon lecture, I also ask all of my patients at their well visit, have you had radon testing done in your home? And do you do anything in your basement other than store stuff and maybe go down for um, um, a washer and dryer. But the number of people that exercise in their basements who do not know what their radon level is, is shocking to me. But I would never have known to include that question if I weren't on this commission. And so that's where my kind of passion lies in any way that can be integrated into um, you know, Representative Soloway, you included that so nicely in the write-up about the clinical piece in addition to the public health piece. Um, and Representative Murphy, it really tails, dovetails on what you said about um, you know, that we have some information now and maybe there's a way for us to actually do something in the next year or two about that. But anyway. Like Thank you so much for doing that. That makes all of this worthwhile. If yeah. yep. people like you are already employing these techniques, you know, these uh, health saving, health life saving, basically, um, you know, practices, because that's exactly, and there's, there's stuff that we talked about with lead too. And I feel like we've now been able to really talk about how many lead toxic kids there are in New Hampshire and how important it is to abate those structures so that we, you know, the lead dust is abated, but thank you so much for doing that. Um, I, I think we have now boiled this down to two important imperatives to end that document with, and that is that we have an obligation to use this as a data source, and we have an obligation to use those data to advance clinical practice. I think those are two important takeaways. Yeah. And okay. Yeah, it's it's circular. 
it's educating people to ask the questions. The more questions you ask, the more data you get, the more data you get, uh, the better you get about recommendations. So we're, we're uh, and I, I think to me, if, if you added that paragraph uh, about, you know, uh, the registry uh, and which if it's couched in a way that it could be a registry for anything, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a registry per se, uh, but um, just the data collection in general. Uh, and then of course, with the educational part, you've already included that. And all those things that Margaret just mentioned uh, are key. You go to medical uh, 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 meetings uh, and out there, especially when it's face-to-face, -face, uh, there's booths outside uh, the auditoriums and, and you chit chat and you pick up a lot of information just by chit-chatting. And uh, if you have somebody that's really interested in the, in the topic, uh, it becomes very engaging. Um, I did that with, I, uh, in the eighties, I tried to get a mandatory safety belt in New Hampshire. Obviously I failed because we're the only state that doesn't have one. Uh, but I, I would be at all the medical meetings uh, with a little short video clip and questions. And it, it was a very engaging process. Um, and and I, that's part of that dimension as well. Okay. And I, yeah, so I kudos to Margaret for incorporating it. Well, this has been extremely useful. And I think we've done a really good job of distilling down what our end product has to look like. Um, I'm not sure, I, I might ask uh, Mindy to comment on whether you would report data to the state epidemiologist um, as the repository for the data that you collect uh, or would, would you have somebody else in mind? Um, I, th I think it's, we have operatives in the state that could do it. Okay, um, may I suggest, and by the way, I need you to know that um, when we called this meeting, I swore a blood oath that it wouldn't take more than an hour. And I, I think we've actually made a, a, a lot of progress despite the ineptitude of the chair at manipulating Zoom. And I'd like to thank you for your patience in that regard. So. Uh, give me a shot at writing that paragraph. I'll get that to you within a couple of days, and then let's schedule another meeting to go over it and see if we've got a recommendation to take to the commission. Is that okay with everybody? Sounds good. Excellent. Thank you so much. This has been extremely, extremely useful. Um, if we can get one more paragraph out of this uh, that makes us look smart, that'll be a, a <laughs> terrific outcome. So, thank you all. Nice Thanks, job. Jeff. Nice job. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. That's right. <laughs>